Well, I have 12 o'clock. We'll get started because we're always conscientious of uh, parents' time because many of you take lunch period to listen in on our PIC meetings. Um, this is our first PIC meeting of 2020, and if you haven't attended one before, welcome. Um, throughout the year, we'll have a number of interesting topics that we'll cover uh, during, this, during the year um, that we'll bring forward to you. Um, this first one, we really thought, though, um, with the highly unusual year that we're having, that we'd kind of give you a little summation of where we are today and uh, answer any questions you may have, that, if we can answer all those questions as we go. You know, obviously, it's been an unusual time period since March 13th of last school year, and uh, will continue to be for quite some time, I'm afraid. So, um, but we'll we'll get through this and um, talk about where we stand today, and then move forward. Hopefully, you all can see my computer screen on your screen as we've shared it to you. Uh, one of the first things we had to do um, in the beginning of this school year was to create what was called a return to school plan in order to compliance um, with the governor's executive order. And that link is on, should be up on your screen. Um, it's there for you. It's on our website. You could take a look at that plan. Um, it, it basically made us list protocols and practices that we would have. Um, there were highly suggested. There was required practices for us who were in phase four and continue to be in phase four in order to open schools. We will go again. Uh, a little bit of recap then from where we started. Um, so uh, the first thing we had to do in order to open schools for the school year is we had to come in compliance with the governor's executive order and create what was called a return to school plan. Mr. Jaster presented that plan at one of our school board meetings and it is located on our website. The link is there on uh, the screen right now um, to the website uh, where the plan exists. The, the, the plan had required components and highly suggested components in the plan, and we um, had adopted all of those in order to be in compliant to go forward. Uh, so items like mask wearing uh, were some of the uh, plan piece components of that piece of that plan. As we began to think about opening schools, probably late last spring, thinking about what fall of 2020 would look like and not knowing what the governor was going to allow, we we felt it was really important to be able to provide parents choice, knowing that parents would be um, in, in different avenues of what they preferred at this point in time. So we began to work with a virtual option as well as protocols in order to safety, to open the building as safely as possible to mitigate risk. And um, we did offer those two options. And after receiving pretty strong feedback <clears throat> from some parents, particularly who had interest in some of our co-curricular activities, such as band, choir, um, we were offering somewhat of a hybrid model, not the hybrid model that some people think about every other day at instruction, but a hybrid model where you could take some some face-to-face -face courses as well as some virtual courses. Some of the things we did in order to get prepare for face-to-face -face and mitigate risk is the first thing I'll talk about here. Um, you know, we came went out looked at classrooms and it became pretty obvious by the dimensions of many of our classrooms as well as the furniture that, that currently exists in our schools, that the reality of six feet um, between children was probably not a reality. In many cases, we would have had to divide the class in thirds, not in halves, um, in order to accomplish that. So we looked at other devices that were coming out and there were, you know, the, the desk screen was a new thing that was coming out and um, treating of hard surfaces with chemicals in order to uh, not let COVID growth were some of the things that we looked at immediately. Um, and so we, we purchased those, we treated hard surfaces on our bus. Um, there are foggy machines with disinfectants um, that have been around for a while, but now with disinfectants to help with COVID, um, to be, be like 90 some percent effective in killing the germ of COVID. And we purchased a number of those for our buildings as well. Upgraded our air filters. We purchased some um, air cleaning machines for larger spaces, but to purchase one for each classroom was just beyond our means to do so. We did require masks in all of our classrooms and there, there were optional in the elementary if you were able to say, 
Um, you weren't commingling your students. Um, the concept of potting and pooling has come along. And so when you do have exposure, could you limit the number of students who are close contacts by potting or pooling within classrooms or within the school system? And we have done that to the best our ability you know, and still be able to carry that out. We changed the transitions in our hallways and how we entered and exited our buildings with staggered starts, um, reducing the number of kids one way um, directional throughout the building, limiting the number of students in bathrooms in order to reduce that risk as well. With the virtual class classrooms, it did lower class sizes in some cases. Some classrooms, not as much, but it did reduce the number of students in our buildings and the number of students in our uh, classrooms themselves. Particularly the elementaries, the numbers are much lower um, than past. And so that, that in itself allowed for a little more social distancing and potting. We had to take a look at athletics and clubs and other activities we do. Other activities that we do as well. And uh, we had to wait on some guidance from the governor on athletics. Um, she did issue an executive order that allowed it, but still kind of highly re recommended the high contact sports not be moved forward. Um, but the Michigan High School Athletic Association has come out and endorsed that movement forward. So at this point in time, we have participated in those sports as well. Clubs, we're going to go very slowly. We're not saying no yet. We know it's an important part of what we do in educating students. But um, similar to as our country, our state has opened up, we, we kind of would like to see the trend before we begin to uh, open for other items up going forward. And we can talk a little about, about what we're seeing as a trend in just a, a tad. The virtual um, component of what we had to do, um, that March 13th order that came from the governor last year was an order that would be closed for three weeks in our case because we had a spring break in there. And that the hopes was that we would be reconnecting. Um, so we were trying to just simply stay connected to our children at that point. And then during that break, we realized the order was going to be for the remainder of the school year. Well, at that point, our staff was already at home. Our students were home. Luckily, we had the de devices distributed at the time to our students. We still had some connectivity issues to solve. And the order from the governor was somewhat vague in that we weren't supposed to issue grades um, we weren't to have too high rigorous standards at that point in time. So the spring learning, we hope, is not what we are doing at this point in time. And in order to do that, we began to realize that our teachers needed more tools as well as training. And one of the tools we knew is we need a learning management system for blended online instruction. And we purchased a product called Canvas. We trained our, began to train our teachers last June, provided training all summer, and we continue to do so uh, with help sessions as our teachers continue to work with that with those pieces of it in order to provide virtual instruction. It was our hope um, as we get, began to have parents sign up that every virtual course would be taught by a Midland Public Schools teacher. Um, we did some incentives and some collective bargaining agreements with our teachers um, in order for some of that to occur. We were able to accomplish that at the elementary level. Um, we have 40 sections of elementary, a little over a thousand students participating in virtual instruction, and they all have an MPS teacher teaching their content 100% of the time. Um, the secondary level, not so much. We, um, we were a bit surprised we didn't have as many takers of teachers who wanted to, to teach for a stipend in the secondary level. So we did end up using a third party provider of instruction in curriculum called Ingenuity. Um, and so the secondary level is vastly different than the elementary level at this point in time. We did need additional staffing to accomplish this. It wasn't simply moving 40 teachers out of the elementary over into virtual uh, instruction. Um, we still had uh, classes that we had to cover back in the elementary. With 40 sections of those, um, 18 of those teachers did move from the face-to-face -face environment to virtual and we added a, an additional uh, staffing through there. Um, our additional staffing somewhere around 15 to 18, because at the secondary level, we, we hire additional what we call electronic learning facilitators to uh, connect with, with those students taking those ingenuity courses as well to support their needs there. Our current role right now with COVID um, is 
kind of defined best by positive tests and close contacts. And so that number continues to change throughout the district um, pretty daily. But we, we have a great health department that we talked with um, just a few hours ago, um, and we talk almost on a daily basis. And they are sending us a daily report now of the known cases that they have. And sometimes that reporting does trail a little bit depending on where they were tested and how soon the results were there and how soon I get access to from the health department from there. Um, so right now, um, a still pretty positive trend in that we've had um, two positive cases of either staff or students in our school. But we do have a number of close contact cases that have grown now, um, approaching 20 at this point in time. And we're going to release some of that information very soon. It's grown over the last few days. The other component of our positive cases is those occurred outside of the school district. And the uh, many of the close contacts we've had, uh, with an exception of a case at Northeast, they were close contacts of their parents in their home. And so, so far, we, we appear to be avoiding to be the spreader of this disease at this point in time. From there, um, we're in a little bit of a clunky environment here with a Zoom meeting, and we have a few folks live, but we'd be, we'd be open to answering any questions that the parents may have at this point in time. And with me, I have our three associate superintendents who have different duties in that. So as you ask your questions, we may use um, any one of the four of us to answer your questions. So Cindy, can you um, have them uh, indicate if they'd like to speak from you and you let us know? Yes. <clears throat> So while you're pausing and thinking, I think I'll let Mr. Jaster come up to the podium since he was the author of our return to school plan, Jeff, and you could kind of talk just a little bit about maybe some of the detail that's in that piece of it. Thanks, Mike. So um, yeah, just to restate a few of the things that were covered by Mr. Sherrill, um, what I would highlight is that, again, we really did take um, seriously the strongly recommended guidance that was issued in the executive order 147 and and the only item in fact that was strongly recommended that we couldn't include was obviously the social distancing based on the reasons that uh, mr sherrill identified i think what i would add is that once that guidance uh, was in place it was delivered uh, to the board of ed on august 3rd I think we had a, a due date of August 15th, but that was when our board meeting uh, was scheduled and met. From there, we took that, shared with all of our building principals, and each school then was uh, requested to take the guidance from the district template and create their own version of a building plan with specific guidance for families, uh, students, and staff about how different procedures that would normally occur during the school day were going to be adjusted. So everything from arrival in the buildings, uh, the check-in process in the morning, the way lunches were going to look, how recess time was going to be scheduled and how they were going to avoid um, co-mingling of students to the extent possible by scheduling all these things. So our principals really did a good job uh, taking the guidance in the district plan and putting it in a more usable, user-friendly plan that was then shared with all of the uh, stakeholders before school started. I also know that much of the first couple of days uh, of PD, where teachers were on site uh, prior to kids arriving, we spent a great amount of time making sure staff understood expectations, that they were comfortable. Uh, we certainly had a lot to consider when, when you think about taking what, what maybe was a normal procedure, even uh, for lunch, for example, to have a large group in the cafeteria, then we're gonna have all those kids eating in classrooms. So supervision questions had to be answered. Just lots of things to work through with staff. And I know the first couple of days, that probably occupied the majority of their time, which um, in a typical year, that would not be the case. 
So again, I would just highlight that I think um, as a district, we did a really good job uh, and we're maybe not exactly all doing every procedure the same way in every building. It's somewhat dependent on level too. So what an arrival at elementary looks like, for example, might be different than middle school or high school. But in general, I think we're all on the same page with uh, very similar procedures and expectations for students and families. So that would be my addition. Mr. Cheryl, um, Kim White has a comment. Thank you. Um, I just, I wanted to say, um, I have a 10th grader at Midland High and we are 100% um, virtual um, because we have to protect an older son that we have that has Down syndrome and type one diabetes. So we had to make the decision to do virtual. Um, I'm just blown away by the choices um, that you guys made or, or the teachers that stepped up for the virtual teaching from MPS. They are outstanding. Um, they've done a great job of, um, you know, chatting with the students, getting to know them, and then, um, you know, working with them where they're at and where they need to be. So, I mean, that's what I can say for the beginning here. Um, ingenuity, that's a whole nother story. And um, I am not happy. So um, <laughs> I am trying to reach out as, as we speak um, to see what we can do to close that gap. There's just such a gap in learning. Um, he has three with Midland Public School teachers. They're doing outstanding. And then he has three classes with ingenuity and it's just not even close. And um, I'm paying close attention to both of them um, and because of this being so new. Um, he did have an ingenuity class last year that I just was unhappy with. And so it was kind of like, oh, we're going to have three of them on ingenuity this year. Um, Anyway, that's my comment, like right at the get-go. Um, you guys have known me a long time, um, and I, um, I do appreciate the, the connection that we have with the, the MPS teachers. So I just wanted to say that. So thank you. Yep. Can we, um, we, we try to be upfront as it can be, knowing that we believe um, e-learning cannot match face-to-face -face learning. And certainly ingenuity um, being a uh, really a content driven uh, curriculum with only some support from our electronic learning facilitator uh, it is difficult course and probably is not a anyway a one for one replacement of being in our classroom 180 days um, with our instructor support that you have in there and that content expertise on a regular basis so um, I think we kind of went in knowing that and really wanted to encourage our staff um, to offer more courses. Um, we put a pretty good stipend out there. We spent a lot of money. Our, our COVID bill for opening the school year between extra staffing, PPE, course development, purchasing courses, um, it's going to be pretty close to $6 million by the time we are done. Um, sometimes I think we're a glutton for punishment in the sense that we we really, really felt that we needed to offer both of these. And many districts, as you saw, either did one or the other um, and are still struggling if they should go into school face to face. Should they not? When does that occur? And um, it would have been easier for us to con certainly concentrate on one, just one or the other. And so I'm glad you complimented the staff because they've been the unsung heroes behind this. And have sort of, certainly their anxiety and their wellness is um, in, in a particular spot as well as they work through. Um, these trying times and being back in classrooms or becoming a teacher who is teaching purely virtual and trying to build that relationship with a student through the virtual. One of the positives out of this of being in face to face and have make have made it so far four weeks is we really felt strongly we'd build relationships with students which are needed and if we should have to um, transition quickly to full, full vir virtual we'll at least have that relationship component built. We, we did have laid the expectation and training for our staff if we should have to transition to virtual that we'll do so in two days and that their content should already be built out a number of days out in front. Um, that was a bargaining component that they very much felt they needed at least two days to transition. And so we'll watch those numbers and see if that either comes from the governor or we do that locally. Um, we recognize we could end up um, transitioning at any point, a classroom, a building, 
an entire district um, if the need was there uh, for a period of time to do so. And so our teachers are, are racing and becoming um, much more of an expert of blended instruction. Um, there's probably a positive out of this and that our teachers' tool sets and their capabilities um, to this virtual environment have changed. And if we ever should get back to more of a normal environment, a face-to-face, -face, blending instruction and staying connected to the virtual world is, go is going to be much better because of the skill set as well as the tools that we have bought in the PD that we've invested in our teachers to do so. Cindy, if there's not other questions, I might bring uh, Penny Mr. Miller up to talk about that. Mr. Sherrill, we do have a couple. Okay. Um, Jody Gardner um, can't go on audio. She's got some background noise going on, but her, her question is, one concern I have is that is with the AP course textbooks, it feels like this was not thought out completely. Three weeks into school, we still have no textbooks which are required. I'm gonna have uh, any answer to that question. Um, and there's, I think there's a little more background to what occurred there um, as far as national shortage of books because of the switch to virtual. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, really, I, I don't have tremendous more uh, information beyond what Mike just said. So I will just share, um, like us, many other schools across the country are using Edgenuity as a vendor. And there was an immediate uh, supply and demand issue when it came to uh, utilization, availability rather, of AP textbooks. And we have been trying to uncover every opportunity to find those even through secondhand vendors and, and simply can't. And uh, I assure you, it is not our ideal state to be three weeks into the school year and to have students not have all of the materials that they need to be successful. My understanding is, however, that counselors have connected with those students and families, uh, and if that's not true, please, please let me know that, to make alternate arrangements to either determine how we can proceed within the course without the exact match of a textbook or to transition students to another course, either in Edgenuity um, or with one of our MPS teachers if there was a comparable option. I'm going to pause since I know you don't have audio if there's something else that you need to inquire about around that specific topic in the text box. Um, no, we are having difficulty. This is from Jody. No, we are having difficulty, especially with AP environmental science. Okay, can you let her know if she can hear me all right that we'll connect uh, after this meeting. I'll give her a call and hopefully we can work through that to find out where the gap is in the communication. Sounds good, Penny. I, I believe she, Jody can hear you, so. Okay, okay. we'll be in touch, Jody. I think there was, there was another question, wasn't there, Cindy? Yep, we do have a couple more. <clears throat> we have Anna Smith, who would like to say a few things. Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, Anna. Okay, I just wanted to say I do have a 10th grader at Dow and an 8th grader at Jefferson. Um, and my, we are both, they are both 100% virtual using Agenuity. Um, I just wanted to say I, I have been pleasantly surprised and happy with the program. It's very well organized um, and allows them to work pretty independently. Um, and I just wanted to give a shout out to um, your special education crew at Jefferson. My um, eighth grader has an IEP. Um, she has a reading and a writing disability. Um, which is a little bit difficult, um, as you can imagine, to not have that teacher in the classroom in front of you. Um, but that staff has done an amazing job of making sure that um, she receives, you know, accommodations and, and um, what she needs um, to be able to reach her goals. Um, and, and kind of um, just get her the material and, and things that she needs. And and just wanted to give a shout out to that crew. Um, they, they did an amazing job. And I know, um, you know, it's been quite the, quite the task. Um, you guys were faced with a lot of, a lot of things to get done and, and just appreciate everything that they've done. So um, just wanted to, just wanted to say that. So thank you. Yeah, a couple of thought, thoughts off of what you were talking. You know, Ingenuity is the largest provider, third party provider of content to schools. And for them, they were, overwhelmed as well throughout the nation and so 
um, they're having issues with staffing and, and um, product delivery because of that overwhelming demand. Much like Chromebooks, um, it's nearly impossible to secure them in the world. There's a worldwide shortage of them. And so we, we've raced around trying to replace some older versions we've had and recently finally um, believe we are going to get them earlier than the first of the year to our students. So um, this, this switch has certainly caught many vendors, many products off guard on that. And then the special ed side of that, um, certainly it, if delivery of instruction to our regular ed students is difficult it is compounded in the special ed environment with the virtual and so we recognize that and i think we are growing leaps and bounds sadly after the school year started but we will grow and continue to get better at that delivery and supports as we go and hopefully you're, you're experiencing that it's gotten a better as we've gone forward and so and again a lot of effort by a lot of staff because some of them have their feet in both worlds so they're they're teaching some virtual courses and then jumping back in into the face-to-face -face world and again that's new for many of the staffs and how do you deliver some of those special uh, ed services to our students is in the virtual environment a little more difficult the rules and the guidelines that come from the federal government to the states um, also trailed they're, they're, they're getting here and they're, they're adjusting quickly many of them we did not receive until days before the school year started and how some of the deliveries of the services are, are required to be delivered so everyone's adjusting very quickly to this new environment so yeah i'm glad you're you're commenting the teachers because they've done a wonderful job in, in adjusting and they've been very good partners all the way through this we did have a comment from Adrienne Saligar. She said, I, Adrienne, I apologize if I'm not saying your name correctly, but her comment is, yes, the MPS virtual staff have been wonderful. So that's always good to hear. Um, we also have Cindy Smerden, who would like to uh, um, chat for a moment. All right, I'm going to start. We are a hybrid family. We have middle school, elementary, and high school. I have fifth, sixth, and ninth grades at Central Park, Northeast, and Midland High. So it was going to be an interesting year with all three buildings to start with. Um, the elementary teacher is amazing. I'm really enjoying the MPS staff virtual stuff. Just to reiterate what everybody else has said there, great group there. Um, we've been week to week fine tuning how to handle ingenuity classes with our older two because they're Edgenuity with band in person. Um, and so that hybrid option, I really thank you for allowing them to continue with the band, the uh, classes there. Um, we just started fifth grade band. Apparently we're a couple of weeks behind here because of miscommunications. We filled out paperwork, but didn't hear anything. We asked because the fifth grade band times conflicted with the virtual learning block that he was in. Um, but we have been in contact with principals and Mr. Monroe, and he will start band next week, but he will be going to the Plymouth Elementary Band so that he can do band outside of his learning block. So I just wanted to say it's been really easy to get a hold of people or to have people respond to our needs as a hybrid family. And I wanted to compliment the district on that. Thank you again. Um and uh, certainly the auxiliaries are another delivery uh, product that's a little different in this environment and from from face-to-face -face, uh, PPE, PPE protocols as well as the virtual environment. Um, I, I don't know the particulars of what occurred there, but it's not unusual sometimes the fifth grade bands and the band directors trail just a little bit uh, by the time that they get down there with their many assignments into, into the elementary. Um, but I'm, I'm certainly um, not going to speak to that without more knowledge of what, what occurred there. So, um, and yes, you're, you are one that with uh, three different buildings and three different delivery modes, you certainly have your hands full. And so we recognize, you know, you as parents have always been our partners in education, but you probably have increased your participation rate um, 100% from what you have had to do in the past. And that's been difficult. And some of the parents who have chose vir virtual has had some buyer's remorse for lack of better words and would like to switch back to face to face and we would love to be able to accommodate that um, but the staffing issues that would cause particularly in delivery would be just put us back into another 
um, direction immediately for a while. Um, right now, you know, if a large enough group switch back in different areas, we'd have to move staffing back. And then those who are left behind in a, in a classroom in the virtual world could end up with suddenly with a new teacher. And so 10 would have to move to a new teacher and we'd have to move this teacher back. And then we'd have to split some kids that been with a teacher in a face to face to make a classroom. And so that's why we will, we will open that window up in November for parents to choose again for second semester. And we'll need that to close early enough to do the, all the mechanics and the staffing changes. It's basically um, staffing that we traditionally do once a year for a school year, we will now be doing by semester. Um, and there's a lot of work behind the staffing model behind the scenes in order to accommodate those staffing. And so um, it, at times, I think parents have said, you know, where's the flexibility on this? We, and we want to be flexible, but we know it, it's not something we can actually deliver in the middle of a marking period with the staffing models of switching back and forth. So, and you know, I, I think right now, face-to-face -face has gone reasonably well, but it, with, with at some point, if we do get a second wave and growth, some of the people who chose virtual will be saying, well, I was, was right, I should have stayed virtual. And so it could go both ways, depending on um, where our region is, our community is with this uh, epidemic. So any other questions? I haven't received anything else. Anything you want to add on the structural side? Yeah. Uh, Cindy, please do interrupt if, if you notice others having questions or wanting to make comment. I'll just share with you all that uh, we continue to message the importance of Canvas as our learning management tool. And it is really an important tool for us as a system by which teachers can organize their learning and students can access that both if they're currently in a virtual setting or even if they're face-to-face. -face. Uh, I wanna though reaffirm to you, knowing that you're ambassadors um, here as part of our parent information committee and that you go out and speak with other parents in your school community, we wanna remind people that it is but a tool, just like all of the other digital tools that you may hear your students talking about, whether that's Cami or an online math uh, tool, those are just tools to help uh, build instruction and deliver instruction. So we want to always remind our families and our students and our teachers that um, in these moments of virtual and preparedness for virtual, as Mr. Shero said, we're trying to be ready to move to remote learning if we have to, um, that the flashiness of the tools can't replace the relationships that teachers have with their students and that students have with one another in, in the school community. So we have been trying to take extra notice um, from a social emotional well-being perspective as to how students are doing and how our staff are doing and identifying those needs and lifting them up for service and support. Um, if you've been part of this committee the last couple of years, we've had a few presentations where we've talked about mental health and social emotional wellness. And it was a, a really important moment for us at the beginning of the school year when Mr. Shero said, we need to focus on those pieces out of the gate. Academics have always been a point of pride for us here at Midland Public and they continue to be. And we are not suggesting that we're minimizing that, but that our priority in these early phases really needed to be well-being, building your classroom community and ensuring that you have that cohesion uh, not just for success when you're face-to-face, -face, but also in preparedness should we have to transition. So I hope you're noticing when you talk with your students, your children as they come home, that they're talking about the kind of activities they're engaging in to build those connections uh, within their classroom community. To speak to the readiness, I'll just offer um, the readiness to move to remote learning should we have to, and we're all crossing our fingers that we don't. Uh, we continue to work with teachers and support them in, in their readiness for that. We are currently putting the final touches on the revised plan that we used last spring in terms of what schedules could look like and what those services and supports will look like. And I will just also ask you as you communicate with your friends and uh, fellow members of your school community, we want to remind people that if we do move to remote learning, virtual learning, that it will be different from the spring. I think that might have been a misunderstanding that some folks had, even those who chose virtual as their sole instructional model. Last spring was really emergency 
pandemic remote learning. We did not have the typical academic press that we normally would. And if we have to move to that now, and for those who are currently choosing hybrid or remote uh, virtual, it is the expectation from the state and from us that students are having access to learning that meets the scope and the scale of the required state standards. So I, I would ask that you keep that in your mind. And if you find that you're in conversations with folks who are asking about what remote learning could look like if we have to move, to, to remind them that it is going to be much more robust than it was in the spring and that we're gonna be prepared to support teachers and students and families in that. Are there any questions related to that specifically? I do have a couple of comments from participants. Um, this is from Anna. She said, in regards to Agenuity, we learned recently that you can expand the lesson and access guided notes that the student can print and it's formatted as fill in the blank notes. It has been super helpful for us. It may be helpful to communicate this to all virtual Agenuity users. From Cindy Smerden, yes, guided notes for science and history are amazing tools. And from Sudi, she says, yes, thank you for the face-to-face -face option, MPS virtual and Agenuity. My daughter is using all three options and I'll offer her up for her thoughts on comparison on each method when we are all done with this at the end of the semester. For her, it's a perfect world right now. That's good to hear. And thank you so much for sharing those other tips. It has made me think that um, we need to check in with Mr. Lauer, who really oversees our virtual academy and ensure that we're messaging all of those little tips and tricks to parents, families, uh, and students. So thank you for that. Sure. Uh, Mr. Shera was just prompting me to remind you or inform those of you who might not be aware that we are using NWEA testing. Uh, it is certainly a best practice across the state and, and nation as a way to assess student learning in the moment and understand where a student is so that we can help their learning move forward. It really is a tool um, that is about direct instruction in the moment. The, uh, new requirements from the Department of Ed require us to have an assessment product, a benchmark assessment that we can monitor student growth and learning, and NWEA is a perfect fit for that. So we are just finishing up our testing window. This will happen grades, it has happened grades K through eight, and we have those initial scores on which teachers are now doing some intentional planning. In January, we will have another testing window which will give us a mid-year sense of where our, our learners are and we'll be able to again adjust our course of action to support them to meeting the outcomes of the course. And then again at the end of the year they'll have a final assessment. The beauty of NWEA is that it really does dial in very closely the strengths of a student and their areas of needed focus and it gives them a projected growth target of where they know they need to be in order to be proficient by the end of the school year. And they have a huge correlation study back to our M-STEP as a projection tool to know how students will fare on the M-STEP. So tons and tons of information that we can glean from that at a district systems level. But most importantly, it really is a tool for the teacher. And it also is a really powerful tool for an individual student. When a student can monitor their own learning and growth and put a target out in front of them, a goal, if you will, and monitor their progress toward that goal, research tells us that uh, students actually fare better. It builds agency and ownership of their own learning, so we're really advancing in our use of NWEA in that respect, too, for students to use that as a tool for themselves. Are there any questions specific to NWEA? Not any, not that anyone has given in chat right now. Awesome. Okay, what else might we talk about? Um, I had a message here from Jody who says, yes, an overview or orientation to Edgenuity would have been very helpful. Okay, I'll take that input in there as well. Um, while we're wrapping up a little bit, a couple things I would mention. Um, one is food service, and so if uh, if you have followed that at all, at all 
um, the USDA from the, through the federal government down through the states have allowed us to feed all students breakfast and lunch at a reimbursement rate to us. So it's not a cost to the district. And we did so through March through August, and now they've extended it to the end of this uh, calendar year. And so um, I think it will run out at that point in time. But if you're not taking advantage of that, you may want to do so. And so your students have the capability of getting free lunch and breakfast in our buildings at any time. As well as the virtual students, we have pickup locations at our buildings to do that. The other one is about PIC itself. Um, you know, this format and, and the number of participants we have right now isn't where we would like to be. And we've looked at evening formats and parents are very busy at then. And so um, we're sticking with the noon format, but we are recording this and we will put it on our website for others to view. Um, so please encourage other parents to do so. We'll put it in our communique. Uh, certainly spread the word. Um, it, there was a time period where we would have a few reps from every building, but we have opened this up to um, any, any students, guardian or parent in the district could attend this. So please encourage others to attend. Um, the feedback's good for us. The topics that we hope we, we bring are hopefully uh, relevant to what's occurring going on. And we've already brainstormed a number of topics for the school year, but you feel free to send uh, reply back to Cindy's uh, email to you about these meetings, any, any, anything you would like us to cover um, in those going forward as well. Cindy, any other questions? If not, we'll close up for today. Yep, nothing that I've received. Okay, we have one in face, so we'll answer that question. Hold on. I just wanted to say our, our daughter uh, attends uh, Adams and, and we've been really uh, just grateful for the job that they've done so far. At the start of the school year, we had a PTO virtual meeting, and Mr. Cochran talked about the just uh, how much effort the staff has put in, and, uh, and our daughter has been really happy with the with, with everything so far. So thank you for thanks thanks for that. We appreciate it. Those of you who may not heard of uh, Dan Chalk, um, a parent of a, of a child at Adams, talking about his experience so far face to face, right, Dan? Face to face, face to face at Adams, and it's gone very well so far. So, uh, and, and Mr. Factor and himself, which we think has done what very nice transition as well in his first little over a year period there at Adams. So, thank you for saying that. Saying that, um, Mr. Cheryl, we do have a couple more. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, first, um, Jen um, Ringold. Hers is, can Mr. Sherrill speak to the change in the communique about how cases are being reported and if the current way they are reported will be consistent going forward? And then also Dr. Bender would like to, to chat with you. Yeah. Jen, um, talk today with the health department. I think he's going to um, change a format on how we're going to receive that and break that out. Um, so that, so I, I may change the format based on the advisement from the health department um going forward so it's discussion with them um when i first started report it uh, it wasn't something the health department even encouraged me to do but i saw some other districts doing that and thought i should and yet we know that i don't have all the information and so i do not know who all gets tested and who's all gone for testing and some of that's delayed and so um but i think our health department is going to do begin to try to divide that and provide that to us daily. And so it should get better and better reporting to you. But on the on that, we did include the new state link as well as our county health department link that you can go to as well. And then Dr. Bender. Uh, hi, yes, thanks. Uh, so I have a child who attends in-person instruction at uh, Woodcrest Elementary. Um, I appreciate the challenge that the MPS uh, district had to uh, undertake to uh, stand up its various options. Uh, I hope that uh, given the continued um, uh, evolution of understanding of uh, the pandemic that uh, MPS will uh, consider being flexible in its approach to uh, managing that risk. Uh, you mentioned uh, the use of disinfectants for cleaning various services. Uh, the contribution of uh, surface contamination as a um, mode of transmission of the virus 
uh, has been shown to be um, rather small compared to uh, airborne transmission. Um, and so while I um, appreciate the investment in the um, uh, air cleaning machines for larger spaces, although uh, it, not necessarily clear how effective that will be, um, the absence of uh, ventilation uh, in classrooms that don't have any uh, windows that open uh, and the lack of any sort of um, additional uh, air circulation or filtering uh, in the classrooms uh, is a cause for concern given the fact that, as you noted, um, you uh, have decided that you're unable to uh, adhere to the strong recommendation for um, uh, physical distancing of six feet between students. So uh, I hope that you might uh, look at uh, what the Yale School of Public Health has offered by way of even very simple, um, uh, uh, readily constructed air filter devices with box fans and MER filters could offer uh, as some adjunct to improving uh, air filtration in classrooms. Um, finally, uh, I would uh, hope that you uh, could be um, a bit clearer about uh, what plans or steps you uh, might anticipate taking uh, when you might have buildings with uh, cases in staff or students in the absence of any ongoing transmission, as well as uh, what you might be doing uh, or plan to do if you have buildings with evidence of ongoing transmission. Thank you. So we're constantly learning ourselves from health professionals and uh, individuals like yourself, Dr. Bender, but um, air filtration, I, I just want to make sure, I'm sure you know, but um, we do have air filtration in every classroom and we do bring in 40% fresh air into every classroom and they're individually filtered in each classroom. But it's, it's not at the le high filtration level of some of those air scrubbers would provide. And so as we continue to go forward, we plan, do plan of, on buying additional units and continue to do those pieces as well as follow other units. And I agree with you, it's the air more than the surfaces. It appears to be more the air than the surfaces where the transmission has occurred. And your other question was, um, what might we do as we go? Um, my understanding from individuals like yourself, it's very much percent positive tested um, that we need to watch and, and confer with our health officials and follow their guidelines, their leadership and suggestions of what should close. And we are readily uh, open to at any point in time, you need to close a classroom, a building or the district um, if that, uh, that risk cannot be mitigated to our students. We do have a comment from Ray McLaughlin, he said, if anyone in close contact with a positive COVID case has to quarantine and there are two positive cases, how are there only two people in quarantine? Quarantine. Those two people really had no contact with anyone else? Yeah. So the two cases that we've listed as of last week occurred prior to, it was a, um, prior to the weekend the school opened. And so they were not in our buildings. Um, but they were employees or students of our district, and we listed those. As of today, we have a student who's a positive case, and um, his close contacts have been now determined, and that number is, don't hold me specifically, 18 or 20 um, isolated or quarantined students because they were close contacts, close to contacts defined within six feet, 15 minutes or longer. And we work with our health department on all of those contact tracings um, and follow their guidance on that. So hopefully that answers that question. Jen Ringold shared a site, publichealth.yale.edu slash research, and I'll forward the rest to the agenda group. Um, but it ends with school slash ventilation. And so we'll share that as well. Yep. We've read that site and have those all of those available. And that's all I have. Oh, here's another one. Will affected schools be identified where cases occur? That's from Dr. Bender. Yeah. So, um, and then, and Dr. Bender, feel free to talk to your counterpart. Um, the answer is, and definitely yes or no. 
um, as cases um, generate a building um, large enough, we would definitely identify that building if it's an outbreak and take action. Um, a little worried about defining it close enough where it becomes very apparent of who was infected and any adverse reactions other folks may have to them is what I've been given guidance on. And so I can't tell you absolutely yes or no um, that we'd identify the building at all. Um, but but um, right now, this is our first case, positive case, where someone has been in the building when that occurred. So, but I will follow Midland County Health Department's guidance on that and continue to follow that. Okay, I think we're, I don't have a clock in front of me. We're pretty close to one. So we will wrap up. Um, any, any thoughts afterwards, any questions, certainly feel free to send them to us and we'll continue to respond with you on any, anything, any concerns you have there. So this is obviously a very moving um, situation for all of us and it'll continue to move and change directions for us. So thank you for attending today.